Good evening and welcome to the latest edition of the Winter Wildlife Series with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. My name is Keen Richards and I'm the Education Specialist for Fish and Game up here in Nome. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Beth Rosenberg, who will be our presenter. I hope you are excited to look at pictures of bears because we will definitely have plenty of them tonight. Beth Rosenberg has more than a decade of experience working with bears and in bear viewing areas. She has worked for the U.S. Forest Service at the Ann Ann Creek Bear Viewing Area near Wrangell, Alaska, and is the current McNeil River Sanctuary Manager for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. She is pursuing a graduate in wildlife biology and is using photographic technology to enhance our understanding of bear behavior. Beth will also talk about opportunities to apply at McNeil, so if you're interested, make sure you stay tuned for that. So without further ado, here is Beth Rosenberg. Beth, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, and uh, I really appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, it's great to see some faces uh, from the lower 48 and some old friends, uh, and, and just thanks to everyone for being interested in bears and interested in McNeil River. Um, as you can see, Keen said, we'll, we'll look at some pictures of, of bears tonight, and here's a great one. Um, just one small snip of the river at McNeil during peak season. Um, it's an extraordinary place. And one thing I wanted to just introduce and, and maybe uh, give an overview of what I wanted to do tonight, because there's quite a few things, but basically I wanted to walk you through a season at McNeil River, what it looks like uh, for bears for June, uh, July, and August, and uh, what it looks like for the flow of the resources that the bears depend on, because that's important um, it, uh, in terms of how they behave and who, uh, who, who comes to the sanctuary, which of the bears are there. Also a day in the life of uh, the staff at the sanctuary and, and what we do in order to learn about bears at McNeil. Um, it's pretty specific and pretty rigorous, even if it uh, appears from the outside, like we're sitting in the grass watching, which is really how we learn. Um, so a day in the life and then um, and then how we process a lot of our data and information about bears in the evenings and in the winter time. Um, and then uh, how we do our bear IDs. People are always asking about how we know who is who. How do we distinguish one bear from another? Um, so I want to describe how we do that, um, what the process is and what it has been over the years and what some of the big obstacles are to IDs uh, and also um, uh, and over the course of the season, um, how how bears change and how we grapple with that. And then lastly, I'd like to talk about uh, citizen science and how it's so valuable. Uh, people are so interested in helping bears and how we've leveraged some of the power of citizen science to get more information, um, photographic information about bears uh, that helps with identity. So before we dive into McNeil, I just wanted to point out that the state of Alaska uh, has 35 what we call critica critical habitat areas, refuges, and sanctuaries, three sanctuaries. Um, and these are the different levels of protection afforded by the state of Alaska, mainly concentrated in southeast Alaska, some in the interior, but around uh, Cook Inlet. And there are uh, only three sanctuaries in the state of Alaska, uh, which is the highest level of protection afforded by the state. Um, the first one established is Round Island, uh, the uh, lo longest continuous haul out for male walrus in Bristol Bay. Um, and, uh, and then McNeil River established in 67. And, uh, and then the third is jointly managed with the Forest Service in Southeast Alaska, Stan Price uh, uh, Sanctuary, also referred to as Pack Creek, um, which is brown bears on Admiralty Island. But for McNeil River, um, when it was designated in 67 by the legislature unanimously, it was established to provide permanent protection for brown bears and other fish and wildlife populations and their habitats. Um, and that is the main goal of what we what we work on at McNeil. Um, bears come first, and and uh, that governs that governs the way we behave on the ground and how we uh, how we do the biological monitoring of the congregation. And really, uh, it sounds like a bunch of people have been to McNeil, but just uh, just as a refresher, it's uh, it's in the summer months when the Pacific salmon are returning to um, 
to spawn in McNeil River. It's uh, the largest congregation of brown bears that we know of. And, and there are other places where brown bears congregate, but because we have so much of the river in view, um, a quarter mile of a McNeil River, there's, there's quite a few bears in view um, at a time during the July months. And that gives us an opportunity to see um, a lot of behavior and a lot of, uh, a lot of individuals. Um, in June, uh, the, there's three basic seasons at McNeil, June, July, and August. In June, um, we're at McFit Creek. Um, it's a red salmon run. And you can see here, camp in the distance, bears are coming out of hibernation and dropping down onto these sedge meadows. Um, it's quite an extraordinary time for us because we get to see bears rolling back into the sanctuary uh, that have been uh, gone and uh, we haven't seen in, in several months and observe uh, who's returned, what uh, what the differences are in uh, sex and age class of the grouping that comes, who has cubs, what's happening. Um, it's, it's a really vibrant time at the sanctuary. Now let's see, this is, I'm not sure these are moving forward as well. Hmm. There we go. Um, so, and unlike, um, you know, McNeil River, which is a which is a big system. McFit Creek is a, is smaller. It's a much more intimate setting, uh, and so we spend time at a few different spots on the creek. But this is one spot in particular, um, the McNeil, the McFit, excuse me, riffles, which are uh, filled with bears here. And there's just a, a small little section where the reds run up, and so this can be quite dynamic, as we know in um, in June and also at the lower falls of McFick Creek and the upper falls and bears are rolling in all the time in June to McFick and we really get a chance to watch um, rank and hierarchy work out um, see how the bears are fishing here we can see um, some high grade uh, red salmon um, it's uh, it's quite a, a feast there's about 3,000 fish that run up that creek and, um, and again, just because we have the opportunity to, um, to sit and watch bears in such a way, uh, this is a wonderful video from Drew Hamilton, uh, previous sanctuary staff, um, sitting on the, on the gravel bar in the creek. And here you just see a series of bears. Uh, obviously the reds have just made a little push. A bunch of bears are eating a fish. The bear second from the right is about to make a little move on the, um, the bear to his right. There we go. And there, there's, um, there's, there's nothing to do but watch really at McNeil. Um, even though today we're talking about how we ID individuals and how we learn really the goal of our time at the sanctuary is to just learn from the bears um, and see what they're doing and, uh, and, and go from there. But in order to set the stage for how we might be able to get so much information and get IDs and, and learn about so many individual bears. These uh, images and videos give a sense of how that how that might work because we really um, are lucky uh, to have to have access to that to that number of individuals. And in June, of course, um, we're looking at bears that are big and well furred uh, adult males. This is an adult male we we call Rocky. Um, they're like cattle, they're grazing on sedge. Uh, the McFit Creek is one of the earlier red salmon runs in the Lower Cook Inlet. And so uh, probably bears that are fishing McFick uh, are some of the bear, first earliest fishing bears uh, in Cook Inlet. So that's uh, that's fun. And then, and then of course seeing um, in June who comes over the spit uh, with cubs. This is another really interesting um, and difficult set of IDs to make on female brown bears. Um, not hard to do when they have cubs because we just use the cubs to identify, but really tracking those individual females is so important. Um, this is a bear we call bearded lady um, arriving uh, at the sanctuary with three spring cubs. And, and again, this uh, video was actually taken. This was the first time we saw her and those cubs this season. And it is, um, it is interesting to note that the cub, the dynamic and behavior of the cubs obviously has a little bit more anxiety associated with it than her, um, than her level, her comfort level. She's used to the group. She's used to seeing camp. This is actually right outside camp. Um, and so that habituation to our presence has um, allowed us to be able to see quite a lot, especially um, in July, we uh, were at, we're at McNeil obviously. And, and this is the, uh, you know, as you guys well know, and um, and it's just the usual suspects. Uh, really, quite quite a vibrant day. Um, sitting and uh, and just observing. You know, the fishing styles. 
um, we get to uh, see who's doing what. And there's all different styles. Some bears always fish one way. Some bears never do. This is a bear we call Seuss. He's just demonstrating his particular uh, style. There's some bears um, that play all the time. Um, if they're full, I guess, we would have to qualify it. Um, but some bears, you know, uh, who play, um, some bears who don't, you know, again, just if we were picking a series of uh, behaviors, uh, just from what we can see from the pad, um, it's very interesting, again, in the interest of distinguishing between individuals and individual behavior, um, who's playing with whom. Uh, not every bear plays with every other bear. Um, not every other, not every bear plays. What could it mean in terms of relatedness? Um, what can we track? What can we observe? We really see it as our um, privilege to and job to just just observe anything that we possibly can. And um, and then of course um, when the uh, peak season fish run comes. The, depending on water levels and depending on the number of fish, some of the spots can get crowded. Uh, and this is a familiar sight, I guess, to some people who've been there. Here we can see a few of the uh, a few of the usual suspects. Here's a bear we call sideline, keeping this pintail out. A couple of the younger bears, some waiting their turn. Um, there's there's prime fishing spots. There's there's uh, a lot of uh, interrelated dynamics happening in every frame um, and when we're viewing. And so we can learn a lot about who's who and what they're doing. You can see this guy's trying to sneak in right here. And that's um, a very specific behavior. Uh, and the fact that these bears are all tolerating each other um, is an interesting statement. There's a little bit of a, a conversation happening with this bear. But again, we can learn a lot by uh, by seeing uh, what's going on, but it depends on knowing who's who uh, and, and which bear is which, because not every bear does that. So there's, uh, there's bears, of course, that don't um, get along. And uh, we have a, an, a bear we call the alpha male, who's the do been the dominant bear for several years, chops. And, um, and rather than being able to um, accommodate and habituate to other, especially larger adult males here, he's with a bear we call Tina Fey. He's, um, you know, constantly pushing and potentially uh, in, in conflict with other bears more than um, other individuals. Here's, um, this is a bear, this is an interesting, this was a couple years ago, here you can see a fish in the background. Um, this is a bear we call Revlon. He's got the upper hand, he's on the high ground, it's his fish, but still he's gonna get outmatched. Um, and, uh, and a bear we call Bobber, who's quite dominant, is going to get in there and take it. And so we, uh, we can learn about rank and hierarchy. How does it work? Who gets the fishing spots? Who gets to steal fish? Um, all of that. Uh, all of those dynamics are, are very important um, for learning about who's who. And then, of course, in, um, in August, we're in the mouth of the river. We love doing this and gives us the chance to be at uh, eye level. We're just sitting on the gravel. Um, and this is when a lot of younger bears return to the river. Um, and, uh, and then some of the, uh, the young adult bears, um, it's, this is just us sitting uh, at Ender's Island. And you can see here, there's a, a fish he's kind of trying to trap in this back slough. Um, we have the opportunity to see how some of the, um, some of the bears have, have grown and changed over the course of the summer. And of course, we'll discuss this further, how they physically have changed as well. Um, and, uh, and again, it's always a treat um, when fish get caught in the back slough um, in the lower river. I would highly encourage people to come in August because we really do get to see quite a different set of bears um, at that time and, and get up close and personal. It's, it's a little bit more relaxed. A lot of the dy dynamics have been worked out uh, between bears and, um, and some of the adult males who fish the falls have moved on to other areas. So it's, uh, it's a really interesting time. But that's kind of the lay of the land. And then um, here's just, you know, the group sitting um, kind of down below. Uh, again, just one other kind of day in the life uh, oops, uh, view. And, uh, and you can see, for those of you that have been here, um, sometimes the other thing that happens in August is we get to learn a lot about uh, who the cubs are and who's starting to feel uh, a little more brave than, uh, than they were at the beginning of the season. Uh, but that's a nice view of what we do as a group, um, sitting nice and tight and uh, staying quiet and moving slowly. Um, so 
IDs, a lot of times people ask about how we do that and how do we get to know bears? How do we get to know individual animals? And, um, and I wanted to share some of the ways we do that. And, but to first kind of dis describe maybe why that's important and, and in the context of some other species. So a lot of times when we talk about animals or populations, we're discussing a population level question. This is a beautiful image of the uh, Wapiti wolf pack um, in Wapiti, Wyoming in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And, um, and so I just put out a couple of questions again, why, what would be, um, how would we answer questions differently um, on a population level versus an individual level? In other words, uh, for example, does a sea turtle return to its natal beach to lay eggs? Well, we wouldn't be able to answer that question if we didn't know uh, individuals, if we couldn't distinguish one individual from another. Um, or a behavioral question, you know, how does the so social hierarchy in a wolf pack form through individual interactions? Uh, all the wolves in this Wapiti pack, there are, um, there, there are roles that different animals play in the pack. And if one animal's removed or another, um, another animal's removed, how does that affect the dynamics? Again, we wouldn't be able to answer that question on a population level. Um, that's an individual level question based on, um, based on who's who and which wolf is, is which and how they function in, in, the, small, uh, in the small pack. Um, resource use in physiology grants uh, Grant Held Brand's excellent article. Um, the question, what is the relationship between individual resource use and physical development for brown bears on the Alaska Peninsula? In other words, how many fish, how much salmon does a brown bear need? How dependent are brown bears on salmon? And that question has a lot of implications for habitat and conservation. But again, we need to know who's who in order to answer that, because if we looked at four different bears, we wouldn't be able to gauge the importance of um, resource use for the individual, we'd, we'd have to know who's who. Um, and then, you know, a management, a couple of management questions. So what's the population of black bears on the Kenai? You obviously can't count the same bear over and over, or, um, or you know, uh, is this uh, the same black bear individual who's getting into garbage on bases in a neighborhood? Again, you need to know who's who. And so these kinds of questions are really uh, interesting and important. And, um, and we think, uh, we, at least at McNeil, try and um, really take seriously uh, in a very detailed and systematic way the, the way we do IDs. And so this is just a general kind of uh, list of how do, where do we start? Every, every day, um, and those of you who've been there know this, and hopefully others of you will maybe come this summer, you know, we just keep a running list of notes of everything that we're seeing. Um, who's there? How big are they? Is it a male or a female? Is, it, um, is that bear well furred? Is that bear uh, shed out? Does that bear have any specific distinguishing characteristics? Does that bear have any notable behavioral uh, peculiarities? Um, any claws, ears, where is the bear? All these things. And then of course we take photographs and we every night or almost every night um, sit down with each other and play who's that bear um, and try and go through some images and see if we can stay on top of who's who. So males, um, males sometimes are easier because they're the body structure bigger, uh, tend to be a little bit longer um, than females who tend to be a little bit more shorter and squat. Females um, tend to also be cleaner. They obviously make physical contact when they're fighting and defending cubs, but they don't tend to make as much physical contact as the males who get scarred up. You can see this is a bear we call Holden. He's uh, scarred up and um, Seuss, I'm picking some bears that people might know, but just uh, those scars can be helpful in doing IDs. Whereas um, again, with the females or the sub-adults, um, the younger bears, this is something that my counterpart in Brooks and I talk about in the winter time. You know, we, we go through hundreds of photographs of sub-adults trying to figure out, okay, what tiny little details can we use to distinguish one from another? Because there's very few. Um, so what do we mean by a, a high confidence identifier? This is um, some specific physical characteristic, usually physical characteristic, that makes it uh, uh, pretty much 100% we know who this, this bear is uh, right off the bat. So this is a bear we call Simba, uh, this plus sign on her top of her muzzle. She got that when she was a yearling. And um, we can, if we can see that, um, we know that that's, uh, that's her. This is a bear we call Joker. He's a, a McNeil bear, and he's got a rip up the left side of his upper lip um, up to the upper jaw. And so he's, when we see that, you know, that's a very, um, that's a very notable 
uh, a very notable scar. This was a bear we called Derek, and he had a, a healed scar, uh, right side scapula that was very, um, very noticeable. Again, whether he was uh, fully furred or shed, you could tell that scar. Um, you might need to pull in some other things, but that that was a very uh, distinguishable scar. Um, and then we use ears, claws, anything we can. Sometimes in that sense, though, we have to start combining. This is a bear we call goblin. This is an example of an ear, you know, this this left ear got munched. Um, and so he's, you know, this happens with males. But again, this is something you could say, all right, we can use this if we just see a characteristic like that and we pair it with other characteristics, we can start saying, okay, that looks like goblin. And he's got these physical characteristics that, that we know goblin has. Um, waterfalls is a female we know well. Claws are a biggie. Um, claws are a very helpful identifier. This is um, a bear with a raised claw on her front left paw. And even from a distance, and you can see, I don't know if your computer shows up, but you can see her raised claw. And she's a very well-known bear, but that raised claw um, is unique and it's it's that second one in. And so we know um, at a distance often that that's her. Um, claws, if they're, some, if they're lighter, that helps. Or if they're missing, this is a bear we call Braveheart. And he only has four claws on his front left paw. And so over time, um, and I'll show you some pictures of him when he was younger, um, we've been able to track him because that's a very unique, um, that's a, a very unique identifier. And light claws is different than white claws. So this is a bear we... Uh, um, we call every girl and she has very unique, it's a, it's a, uh, it's specific, uh, a genetic specificity. She has really, really white claws. So that occasionally happens again. These are things that make our job much easier. Um, and so in the absence of say one of those, um, very specific identifiers, you know, how do we, um, how do we, how do we tell who's who? And I kind of put this slide together because, uh, you know, just the way you would, I have a, a dear friend who teaches kindergarten, and um, I feel quite certain that if I walked into the room of kindergartners, I wouldn't be able, I would see 25 children who looked similar to me. Um, but again, if I spent days looking at them and working with them and just getting to know who they were individually, even those very subtle characteristics would start parsing out. And interestingly, over the course of four days, um, even for a visitor to McNeil, um, those same kinds of things happen where bears start, uh, they, it becomes very obvious some of the differences between individuals, even physically. So here you can see if you were just looking across, what if I were to propose that all of these pictures were taken on the same day, so there was no fur change or um, you know, there's a little bit of a lighting difference, but you can see if you just skim through here um, that these individuals do physically look different. Um, it might be harder in some ways to, to see differences, but um, th the possibility exists that we can tell the difference between, um, between bears physically and not rely on the matching of, uh, say, genetic loci or the tagging, which are very valuable tools, uh, very valuable research tools. But we're proposing, what if we, instead of matching loci um, in a, in a, uh, on a genetic sample, we're matching physical characteristics and traits one to one. And if four match up at some point, um, what uh, what are the chances that it's the same individual? And so we have just hundreds of pages of notes. We do this every night. Okay, here's two bears. We've got these. We a couple of us saw a bear with a scar on the top of the muzzle, but that's not the same scar, not the same bear. So we need to parse that out um, and uh, and be very specific. Here's a bear we call belly scratch. We had some confusion with an animal, and so we had to um, specifically photograph the couple of bears that we weren't sure, um, and then really identify those scars so that we could say, okay, um, yes, we feel confident that this is the same bear or that it, it isn't. Um, we do a lot with different years and the shape of the head. Um, and again, things change and scars slightly here. Here you can see a parallel scar. It's difficult over time, but not impossible if you have, um, if you have the photographic uh, data and the notes and, and, uh, and Larry Allmiller, who um, obviously pioneered the work that was done at McNeil River, was able to track the lineages of, um, of several females over 30 years um, and younger bears. Teddy and, and White. And so um, that's just from 
uh, taking note of physical and behavioral characteristics. Fur is obviously hard and we'll talk about that, but sometimes fur sheds um, stay the same over time. And so here's a, a unique fur shed on an animal, an example of another kind of strange detail we might use, or another example of, you can't just say scar on the left side muzzle, because here's uh, two scars, left side muzzle, same exact place, but two different bears. Um, and you can see other things. So again, I don't want to harp on it, but there's um, there's a lot of very high detail comparisons that go into um, into those uh, into those matching of scars and trying to figure out IDs. And then we started doing this a few years ago, which has been very interesting, which is taking photos um, using the timestamp and photos in series um, to lock in IDs. And so this is a bear we call Big Head and he has a very distinguishing uh, left flank scar. And so once we see this, we know it's him. And what if we just sat on him and took you know, 20 pictures in a row, um, all timestamped in sequence so that now, even if we just see this scar or see a combination of these two, we can say, ah, we don't know, um, we, we can't see the thing that we know is him, but we've locked in it in another place in time sequence, a series of scars that are identifiable with this animal and, and, um, and then combined with other things, we can start making our lists of, of how we can identify him, even if we can't see the one thing that we know to be him if we've locked it in. Uh, before. So again, um, that's just some examples, but so what does this kind of allow for then? Um, and let's just maybe run through some examples because this is interesting um, on, a, on a level of, uh, on an individual level. Um, I remember Larry once answered a question when someone said bears are so unpredictable and, and he said, well, actually the opposite is true. Bears are very predictable. Um, but if you see an animal who's doing something uh, one bear who's doing something different from another bear, um, you know, it might be two different bears, um, or you don't know what just ex that bear just experienced before. Um, and so, if if the num if the individuals themselves are known, um, they quite they become quite predictable. So, uh, this is Rocky, a uh, well known bear, and he's. Um, getting to be on the older end of primal life. He has a big round forehead, straight up ears. He's a bear that comes to McFick and McNeil. Um, and he often stays through parts of August. So we see him for a while. He fishes many spots in the river. So he's not a static fishing bear. A lot of um, there are bears in the teen center that he messes with or bears, static fishing bears who come and stay in one place, not Rocky. He's, um, he moves all over uh, the river and, um, and he's a very playful bear, even uh, as an older bear. Here he is, um, this is Rocky in the back. He's big and he oftentimes wants to play with bears who don't want to play with him. Um, and it's interesting because that play behavior as with any species tells us a lot, but um, he's just really trying here. Um, and again, it's interesting because not all bears play and not all bears play with each other. So, but, but that's one of Rocky's characteristics. Um, and he's uh, he's a, a bear that probably a lot of uh, a lot of you are used to seeing. Um, on the flip side of that, Mask is a bear. Here he is as a as a younger guy. We met him um, when he came on the river, and uh, we're first able to really put an identifier on him. He's got splotchy fur and those big um, diamond shaped um, eyes. He was always playing with some of the other bears in his age cohort. Um, and then as soon as he got to be a bigger bear, he stopped doing that. Here he is um, this year. And this might surprise some people who are used to seeing Mask. Um, he's gotten enormous. He's, his frame isn't big, but he's, um, he's really great at fishing. And, um, and so it's interesting. So his behavior is slightly different. He's less playful than he used to be, but he's still um, right in the mix and he's, got, uh, he's remained um, familiar with some of those bears that he, we, we observed him playing with now as he fishes um, in the teen center. And then of course, Braveheart, um, and people probably know this bear pretty well. Uh, so again, what's some personality characteristics or temperament characteristics? He's a high ranking male, um, and he's gotten to be a, a large bear, although we knew him as a smaller bear um, starting in 2007. Um, he's a high confidence ID. We recognize him physically, but also he's got the missing claw. Um, he often comes to McFick, although not a uh, guarantee, but he's a McNeil bear and he often stays through the silver run um, at the end of the season. It's interesting because Chops, who is the alpha male on the river, um, 
takes, uh, is, there's two or three males now who uh, Seuss and Tina Fey and Braveheart who Chops is specifically pushes. And so we notice that now um, when Chops comes in, Braveheart goes, uh, moves away, moves to another part of the river. It's an interesting dynamic, uh, definitely observable between those two individuals. Um, what about, say, a female, Sloth? This is a bear we've known um, for a number of years. She's a very small but high-ranking uh, individual female. She can hold her own at McNeil Falls um, and is one of the bears that, that fit, one of the females that fishes the falls um, when there can be, you know, 30 or 40 adult males um, and sloth. So she's got this very unusual shaped head. It's an anvil flat, physically uh, very easy to see from a distance um, went from the side. Um, and, uh, and then the strange kind of diagonal shaped ears when she's well furred. Um, she sustained a pretty sizable injury to her front left paw a couple of years ago and ended up still um, being seen uh, at, at a distance. And I'll show you that in a little bit. But she's, uh, again, a bear that we're familiar with in terms of her tolerance. We've seen her um, have three litters of cubs. Um, she's an individual that we, um, that we know quite well now over the years. Um, and, uh, and then again, how do you, you know, how do you use some things? Um, there was an interesting episode a couple of years ago when a bear came in um, and which we thought was chops. It was a big adult, dark adult male uh, with a big bent right ear and uh, chops while he's assertive or, you know, tends to be assertive with other bears is a relatively tolerant male um, around the human group or um, we've seen him in McVick and this uh, bear was, was less tolerant or more agitated. And so we, for an entire season, thought the, the wrong bear was Chops because of so many physical characteristics until we actually got this picture from someone else. Um, it turns out we noticed that this uh, hole in the nose, this picture was taken on July 10th of 2019. And this picture, which is actually Chops, was taken on the 11th. So it couldn't have been, this is a bear we since uh, we call long claw. It couldn't be that he had this injury or this healed scar on the 10th and then um and then it, it disappeared uh the day after so again it's it's sleuthing a lot of the work that we do to determine individuals is sleuthing um and th and then what does that also allow for it allows for us to know individuals over time so here um in 2007 this is a bear i'll show you a couple of examples and we have of course many but um, this is a bear we call aardvark and here he is is just a little guy uh, in 2007 you can see he's very uh, well known that Roman uh, Roman nose, and um, here he is in the river trying. He is trying to hold his own um, when none of the other larger males are in the teen center right here. Um, 2009, you know, he's filling out a little bit, still trying to get in there. Um, 11, he's you know still got that very distinctive, very Roman profile, but by 14, he's filling out. Uh, 15, he's got that characteristic shed pattern that he gets with that kind of lion's mane. So um, here he is 16, you know, 17. He's uh, one of the larger adult males. And now he's taken his place here in the teen center. He's one of the bears in that particular section of the river, forms a horseshoe and they have their spots. They're very accustomed to uh, each other uh, in their fishing styles and their fishing locations. And this is our bark right here. Um, and then uh, sure enough, here he is uh, as an older bear. This was this year. Um, so here's a bear that we've known uh, for 15 years and watched every summer. Um, and so there's, uh, there's certainly a lot to be learned um, from that kind of longevity in observation. Um, but yep, here's, here's old, uh, old aardvark um, this, uh, this summer. And then again, one other one, again, Braveheart, a bear that a lot of people know. Here he is, is a tiny little uh, goober in 2007. This is Braveheart. You can kind of see he's got his head that we recognize, that trapezoidal uh, back. He's still, he's trying to make a go of it at the falls here, but he's really scrawny. Uh, here he is in 2009 um, at McVick actually, and laying down, he's a bear that lays down, he still does this, he's a big adult male, laying on his, uh, his belly in the middle of the stream. Um, and then of course, playing with his cohort, here he is playing with a bear we call Holden. Uh, by 2013, he's taken on that fishing style that he learned from an, an older bear uh, that we had called Jordan of sitting in the river and making himself a feature. Um, and now here um, you can see from that little scrawny bear, here he is 
big uh, Braveheart. Um, and, uh, and then of course, you know, late season, he's, uh, he's an enormous, he's an enormous bear and, um, and a bear who, uh, whose, whose styles, um, and we know well from watching here, he, he likes this summering spot on that far side of the river, um, when the water's high and how he relates to other animals. And, uh, it's, uh, again, one can learn a lot. It's a bear we've been watching for 15 years. And so there's, um, there's all kind of information. So there's, you know, dusty or Holden or waterfalls, and then a whole number of individuals um, that we've, we've just been watching over the years. And it's due to the meticulous uh, tracking by, by staff in the past and, um, and photographing and help from people who visit that we are able to keep track of these animals. And, and, um, and then it, it, it uh, it's, it's interesting, one last one before we go on to some citizen science, but this is a bear we call ears. Um, some of you might've seen this photograph, it was in, in Wild Trust. It's, um, there was one collared study Karen Road uh, did in 2000, some animals uh, out on the Katmai coast. And Larry did not know that ears was gonna be collared, but he showed up at McNeil with this, he looks kind of like a rodeo clown. Anyway, that was um, 2000 and he was probably eight. Um, and then uh, here he is in uh, in 20, uh, 21 fishing the back slough. And so we can do the math, but you know, 30, 30 year old uh, bear. And so, um, and a bear that, you know, Larry had seen for years and, um, and then we got to see and watch a progression of behaviors and, um, and comparisons of physical characteristics and interactions and movement on the landscape. And so there's a lot to learn from watching. Uh, but there's uh, there's ears, 30, age 30. Um, and so we then, um, and this is important because in order to make a case for the fact that these are substantial identifications, every night, um, like we said, we, we sit down and we make folders of individuals and every folder has just pictures of the same bear in it. If it's a bear we know, they go right in. Here's, you know, Ted from 2017, if it's a bear we don't know. Um, but if there we have photo sequences of, we just throw them all in an unknown folder with the date, anything we can observe. And often um, we'll come back and say, oh, do you remember that bear had that thing? And then we can find later that has uh, happened many times where we'll come back and be able to identify a bear that was renamed or some, a bear that um, behavior clicked and we think, ah, that's might be that individual. Um, and then a really interesting thing um, happened a couple of years ago because we realized, well, you know, these bears um, are, it's a congregation at McNeil. It's not a population. They don't live at McNeil. They move through and use the sanctuary. So where are they going? Um, and where have they, where have they come from and where are they going? Um, and those are important questions because habitat matters um, to, to, well, to all of us, but um, bears need space and, um, and resources. And in, uh, in, in circumstances where some of those things might be questioned or there needs to be um, an accurate demonstration of what's required for a brown bear, um, we started thinking, well, you know, if we were looking at this, uh, if we're looking at the map, so McNeil is in here, and then Lake Clark or Reds right in between big Lake Clark National Park, um, and the big brown bear bays of Lake Clark in Niskin and Chinitna, uh, Bruin Bay. And then this is, of course, the Katmai Coast and the big brown bear bays of Katmai, Swick Shack, Hallow, Kukak, Kaflia, um, and then Katmai Preserve and Katmai National Park. And there's a lot of food in here. And so what we thought is, well, what about if we um, looked at the preserve and we looked at the coast? We know people who are going to these places. Maybe we can ask them for pictures to see if we can find some of these bears elsewhere, or maybe we can kind of look for where there might be food and, uh, and go there. So we started at Brooks um, because we have friends there and we've done this for years and they keep track of their bears and Brooks is a little under hundred miles away. And what we notice over the years is that there aren't, there isn't a lot of overlap from um, Brooks River. So that's probably a little too far. Um, so instead, what if we made a circle that was a little bit more like, you know, 60 miles and tried to get everything that we could in that range. And um, sure enough, uh, citizen science proved, um, proved to be a really incredible resource. Citizen science refers to the idea that um, scientists who are pursuing research questions can't be 
in all of the places they need to be in order to make the observations they need to make, say, with bird migrations or um, with brown bears in habitat that's quite expansive. So if we can leverage the power of other individuals who are visiting these places um, and photographing to give images, perhaps we can find something. So I got this picture and here's a bear lounging with a bunch of red salmon um, in the Katmai Preserve. And, and uh, this is not something that we see at McNeil. So we, we have some small red salmon at McVick, but this is definitely um, when the fish are coming in from the Bristol Bay side into the Katmai Preserve. And then uh, from a, a wonderful photographer, uh, Max Black, we got this picture and uh, we know this bear. And this bear was taken um, in late July in the Katmai Preserve. And this is a bear uh, without question that we call Big Ears. Um, and Big Ears, uh, two weeks before, was fishing at McNeil. So here he is on July 9th, uh, sitting on Center Rock and grabbing a fish. And then uh, here he is in the Katmai Preserve on the 26th. And so we did, um, we recognize him, but we did all of our homework in terms of his side scars. He's got a forehead V, he's got slashes. Here he is at McNeil and you can just see, you know, one of his scars, but uh, we matched, you know, we matched them up, his, his uh, forehead scars, his puncture wounds, his thing. Um, and, uh, and so there you have it. Uh, Big Ears um, was, uh, was at McNeil on July 9th. And then most likely, you know, there's, uh, bears are very smart. They'll fall, they're not gonna climb the Mount Ridge, you know, probably followed Paint River out somewhere um, into the preserve. We purposefully circle the preserve and don't specify where the bear is because of uh, concerns about harvest issues in the preserve. And so we like to be uh, general, but suffice it to say that this bear um, went 35 miles from McNeil, which is nothing to a brown bear, um, into the preserve. And we have the photograph uh, of that. Um, and then sure enough, Here's, um, here's Dusty, a bear we call Dusty, an easy bear to see because he has this unusual uh, injury he got arrived with in 2015, had broken lower mandible. Um, and sure enough, um, here he was uh, arriving at, um, at Katmai Preserve when two weeks before, here he is uh, fishing McNeil on July 10th. He was at McNeil this year. Um, the year this was taken until the 19th doing his dusty diving. And, um, and then um, probably followed that same well-known, well-traveled bear corridor 35 miles out to the preserve. And so um, we did our matching, but here's dusty in the preserve um, on the 29th. Uh, again, another photograph from Max Black. Um, Smirk, a bear people might recognize. He is a very notable, I'm picking the bears that are very noticeable, have those characteristics we discussed, um, a very noticeable swollen drooping upper right lip. Um, here he is fishing his far side spot. You can see his lip at McNeil. And then sure enough here, um, uh, Lance Bassett uh, with Emerald Air sent uh, this picture of Smirk uh, lounging in the grass in Katmai Preserve on the 29th. So here he is on the 10th and here he is lounging in Katmai on the 29th, again, you know, between 30 and 40 miles away. So we can find bears, um, high confidence with photographs. Um, who else? Here he is. This is a photograph actually from another person of the same bear, Smirk, uh, Julie Hauer, bear tech at Katmai. Um, he, um, she sent, again, people have been, now everybody's sending photographs and it's, it's quite extraordinary because uh, we've been finding bears that we know all across, the landscape. Um, we we know it's not um, a one-off um, trip because that was 2020 and then 2021. Here's um, it, another set of images uh, of Smirk in Katmai Preserve the next year. So these are routes, these are well-traveled uh, routes from the following, following year. Again, McNeil to uh, the preserve. Here's a uh, bear, um, as we said, uh, Seuss, oopsie. Um, Seuss doing his Seuss diving, and um, he's a, a well-known McNeil bear. He stays definitely through the peak season of fishing, a, a big adult male, very noticeable bumped uh, muzzle. And here he is in Katmai Preserve, July 29th. Um, here is McNeil, and then here is in Katmai. Um, we have over 15 individuals, and those are just the ones that we can easily recognize. Here's Naughty Ears at McNeil. You can tell the head shape. Here's not ears at Katmai. Um, here's not ears, same day. Here's not ears. These are from uh, 
uh, another citizen science image. And again, so what we're looking at is just on the landscape, here's McNeil, uh, July 21, July 29. We can track them with photographs. And then we're, we decided just because it's labor intensive, well, what if we went the other way? What if we went to the Katmai coast? And sure enough, um, I got this picture from Max and this is a bear we call Panda. Um, and here he is on July 20th up uh, the Katmai coast. And here he is um, at, uh, excuse me, this was uh, July, this should say 30th, excuse me. Um, and here he is on the 26th, four days earlier um, at McNeil River on the conglomerate. So here he is McNeil and here he is Katmai. Uh, four days later. So without going through every example, I want to emphasize how interesting it is, um, again, with the detailed photo information, and we have so many other matches um, and can make many more, but it's possible to track bears across the landscape with citizen science. Um, again, just matching up the scars. These are pandas timestamped images with the matching up the scars, the two dots in the line on his head, just to make sure they're exactly right. So we make our case. Um, I'll run through this really fast and then I'll conclude, but basically the other ways that we're using citizen science are to help us um, deal with trying to build a neural network that might identify or automate a brown bear ID um, because it's so difficult. Here's a well-furred ape man um, in early July and here's ape man in late August, not an easy uh, ID to automate. These are the fat bears from Fat Bear Week. This is bead nose. June 29th and bead nose September 30th again. Um, smirk, smirk, two months apart. Smirk, smirk. So these are hard things to um, automate because we don't have any patterning to rely on. Chaser girl well furred and chaser girl shed out a month and a half later. Um, waterfalls well furred, waterfalls in August. Uh, it's a tough ID. So species that have patterns um, that we can rely on. That problem has pretty much been cracked, but what we determined was um, what can we use that isn't really subject to fur shed or weight gain? We thought, what about the profile? Um, we use it all the time. It's very different among individuals. You can kind of see it here. You can look and see it's, um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a, a first principle structural characteristic of the skull. Um, and it doesn't change with weight gain or fur shed. Can we use it? But how do we measure it? How can we tell this is what looks different to us? So we um, actually uh, ended up using a um, marine mammal tracking database that um, does boundary detection on fins, traces the trailing edge of a fin, and then compares fins in a database. So we took heads of bears and we rotated them up and turned them into fins and then compared them and sure enough, uh, Darwin, the marine mammal software, matched up bears with each other and matched up similar characteristics. Here, I was just trying to find the jutting lip of Chops and Holden, which it picked up on. Um, so we recoded Darwin uh, for bears and it's amazingly successful in giving us an idea that we can build a neural network to ID bears. Um, citizen science, we had, uh, we need a lot of images. So we put these, McNeil Bears Need You signs out uh, for a couple of years and asked people if they were willing to donate um, fully copyright privacy protected, uh, donate all their images from the, from the time block that we coded by time block. Um, and many, many people with hundreds of thousands of images, people donated their SD cards. Um, thanks to everyone. I saw Dave come in. Thank you, Dave. Um, people um, are very interested in helping bears in this this was uh, this is one way to help, and so um, we've built the neural network. Here's some examples um, of how it can be even leveraged on video. Um, we bounding boxed, um, trained a network, and uh, actually have had some success. We're working with a, a group out of Harvard and EPFL in, in Europe to build a pipeline to uh, ID a non-pattern species. So. Um, and I'll leave you with this. Uh, we're not the only ones trying to do this. So mountain gorillas, uh, another non-pattern species, um, a very uh, like brown bears, unique individuals um, that uh, one can can go view. And 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 for mountain gorillas, you might think they look the same, but in fact, we use the nose prints. Um, each of these gorillas has a different nose, and you can see no bridge here, big ridge here marking here, three dots. And so um, when you compare the nose prints, it's a matter of cleverly coming up with the biometric that will help uh, substantiate the idea that 
animals are individuals. Um, these are Diane Fossey's drawings of gorilla noses um, and the Habanyanja group uh, in uh, Bahoma in Bwindi National Park in Uganda. So um, it's being done for other species and um, thanks to everyone who's, who's helped. Um, and uh, I'll leave with this picture. Larry always leaves with this picture because he, uh, he loves that we can, we can all get along. We just have to know who's who. Um, and, and please also let me stress that the applications are due on the 20, uh, due in, on March 1st. So please come to McNeil, please put in an application. Um, just putting in an application helps bears. So thank you so much. And if there's any questions. All right, thanks so much, Beth. Wow, um, I know I learned a lot and I hope you all did too. That was fascinating. Um, so we do have some time for questions. So what we'll do is um, if you do have a question, um, you can go ahead and put um, them in the chat. Um, and we have a lot of people. So um, I think we can still probably get through if you wanna go ahead and uh, and raise your hand up in the video or turn off your, uh, or turn on your microphone rather, um, and go ahead and ask a question. Um, it, we'll just make sure to turn them off when we're when we're done. Um, but yeah, go ahead and either drop your questions in the chat or go ahead and ask away um, over your mic. It might be easier to just ask instead of, uh, I can go through the chat, but, or if you wanna ask me from the chat. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. And looking in the chat, I don't think some people are thinking of some questions right now. <laughs> and I see so, somebody said that was my first question application. So glad you covered that. Yes, um, please do. Um, and feel free, uh, beth.rosenberg at alaska.gov or Adam uh, Dubour, who's uh, our supervisor who runs the program, um, does an excellent job. Please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Um, the key is to get the permit application in because it's impossible to win if you don't apply. All right, and then I see we've got, um, it looks like a question um, from Sean and Dave. Um, Sean asked um, that, that if you're still looking for photos that he can send um, some on SD card. And then, um, and then Dave was asking, are you still looking for Katmai preserved photos? So are you still looking for photos and how would be the best way for people to get those to you? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's actually, um, it's a extraordinary how successful, um, how successful that, that program has been, and we're right now trying to figure out, so thank you, Sean and Dave, thank you very much. Um, we will we will be able to use them. The, the question now is uh, finishing the neural network so that we can try and do some IDs and, and manage the data, but hold on to your SD cards because we'll send out, um, the goal will be to send out a message to everybody um, who's, you know, Ben to McNeil, because we can track when, what time people were there. So we know which bears would be in which images based on when people were there. So thank you. And yes, uh, hold on to them. And we will, um, we will be in touch because we're building the system that's going to let us house all that, that information. So thank you. And good to see you. All right. And then we've got a question from Amy who says, um, do you know where some of the males go who leave McNeil um, before the end of the season? Yeah, hey, Amy, um, those, those examples that I showed were some of the, um, you know, the usual suspects, the McNeil usual suspects, those were the adult males. Um, most likely, obviously, well, they're, they're following the food. Um, and recently there's been quite a few fish on that west side coming in from Bristol Bay. That run is quite, um, quite a significant uh, time later than the run at McNeil. So the flow, it makes sense um, that they would move from kind of east to west. So we do know um, now from just these pictures we've gotten from, from people that they're moving um, after McNeil, uh, definitely a, a good number of bears are going into the Katmai Preserve area. Probably, like I said, not to Brooks. Um, there's physical impediments that make it not necessary to go all the way to Brooks, but to go to the preserve and the systems where the reds are coming in on that west side. Um, there was the one bear panda, and we haven't gone through all of the Katmai Coast uh, material yet, but there are bears going the other direction. There was a whale carcass um, on the coast a couple summers ago, later in the season, 
Obviously, sedges are more of a draw early season on that coast, but there's fish runs uh, on the west side of Cook Inlet on, you know, on the Katmai coast as well. So um, stay tuned. We're going to see how many bears we can find. But, uh, but it, is, it is the males um, for now that we've been able to find uh, moving into the preserve. All right, nice. And then um, Stacy is asking, are there um, pictures or IDs published somewhere, like um, in the Bears of Brooks Falls, Brooks Falls um, um, book from uh, from uh, Katmai National Park? Yeah, it, it's a great question. So I um, the, and that is such a great publication. We love that. And Tammy Carmack, who's who does their IDs and puts that together, she's fantastic. Um, I we we share a lot of we help each other. Um, and interestingly, uh, Friends of McNeil River for a number of years did a wonderful hard copy publication of bears that um, became hard to keep up with in a hard copy. And interestingly, um, we were thinking we would then transition and do something similar like a PDF um, or something that could be downloaded. And actually, um, one of our colleagues at Brooks suggested that we not do that. Um, and this is something maybe we can all decide or discuss, but uh, what she said was that if we put together um, a, the ID uh, list on a device that could be downloaded to a phone or an iPad, then when everybody's sitting at the falls, their would, phones would be out um, and that people would be looking at their phones instead of watching the bears. And so we decided against putting it into a form that could be downloaded. And instead this, and, and that, but that is always subject to change. Um, I'm actually making a series of hard copy um, informational sheets on bears for the cook shack so that we can learn more about um, individuals. But as people know who come there, uh, there's a lot to be learned in the four days that you're on site just from the information that you glean uh, from watching. But that is that is the reason why we haven't done the P, the PDF. Um, in, but we're open. <laughs> All right, and then um, let's see, maybe one more um, question in the chat. And then I know some people are eager to hear about the uh, difference between the uh, difference or lack thereof of, of the um, brown bear um, brown bear species or not. Um, so the last question, though, I think that I see in the chat um, is Teresa says, I'm curious about your thoughts on linking the movement to an even bigger picture of other resources, um, like fish runs at different locations. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that's, uh, hey, Teresa, that's, um, that's a, a really important question because, and Teresa is actually a fisheries biologist, so she's a, a really valuable resource um, and colleague. Uh, there are many variables, obviously, that factor into the way bears or any species moves on the landscape, especially um, food. And so fish runs as they um, ebb and flow, you know, obviously a salmon run is, um, is is a, a living organism in and of itself. And so on the lower Cook Inlet, in the somewhere between 40 and 70 mile home range of all of these individual brown bears, there's obviously a flow of resources that fluctuates because unlike a sedge meadow, a salmon run, um, a salmon run ebbs and flows. And so one of the things we're interested in doing, um, and Ted Otis, who is one of the research biologists out of Homer, does an excellent job in surveying that area and, and trying to figure out what's happening on different streams is, is to do, do exactly that, try and see, well, how is, um, how, is the, how, how is what's happening on the different streams and rivers around that area? Uh, how is that affecting the way bears are moving? Um, and could that account for times when we see more uh, bears at McNeil, so, uh, times when we see fewer? Um, how, how might that how might that work? One thing we do know, um, because there have been fewer bears in the congregation for the past couple of years, um, and we've tried to determine what the cause of that might be. Um, the um, Some people have asked, well, are McNeil bears going over and just 
uh, going over to the west side, to the Bristol Bay side for the Reds. And, and that is something we can say um, that that's probably not accounting for fluctuations in the congregation at McNeil specifically, just because the timing uh, is three weeks apart. So an adult male brown bear wouldn't go all the way over to, to Bristol Bay three weeks before the fish come in and stay there. Um, so probably other fish runs are accounting for that particular fluctuation that we're seeing right now, but it's a great question and um, maybe you'll, you'll work on that with us. We would appreciate it. <laughs> All right, and um, I see a lot of um, real positive um, comments in the, uh, in the chat there. Um, people who um, who had a good time tonight listening to your presentation. Um, and then um, lastly, um, unless anybody has anything else um, to add in the chat, um, we did have that poll question um, about uh, about interior grizzly bears and um, coastal um, brown bears. Um, can you speak to that a little bit um, before sure. we all go? Are they are they a different species or not, and why? Yeah, um, I didn't see the exact question. So the, the exact question is, are coastal uh, bears and interior grizzly bears a different species? Yeah, so at one yeah, point, right. mm -hmm, at one point, there was, um, there was, a, there was thinking that there were three subspecies, um, uh, including a third being the Kodiak bear. But in fact, it was determined that they're not uh, different species and that you can't, um, by going over a mountain range, become a different species uh, per se. So uh, brown bears and grizzly bears are different in their access to resources. Um, so obviously in the lower 48, in those eight subpopulations of grizzly bears and in interior Alaska, those, um, those grizzly bears don't have access to the incredible protein-rich um, salmon runs to gorge and uh, all summer, and so they have to travel much farther to get much less, and so they they don't grow uh, quite as big, and their um, behavior is slightly different because um, because uh, the competition for resources, and so um, there are differences in um, in in physical characteristics and behavioral characteristics because of that. Um, coastal brown bears have. A really, it's a the, the coast of Alaska is a great place to be a, a, a brown bear. Um, a lot of a lot of food, and uh, really, if it's just a matter of access to food and access to mates, they don't have to go as far to get what they need. So, uh, but no, not different species. And at one point, also, there was um, some sense that the skulls of Kodiak bears um, that they're much different. But really, um, a fifteen hundred pound brown bear at McNeil is really no, not that much different than a, a 1500 pound brown bear at Kodiak. So um, yeah, same species, but good question. All right. Well, thanks so much, Beth. And thanks to everybody for coming. We really appreciate uh, your attendance. Um, and Beth, um, thank you again just for uh, such a great presentation. And um, we all enjoyed learning a lot about bears. So um, have a great night, everybody. And um, we'll go ahead and make sure the recording is um, is posted um, on the website. Thank you. See everybody this summer. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.